Okay, so, um, all right, so let's revisit um, what we've done so far. So um, we've talked about um, power series, right? And so last time we kind of ended up with um, finding, um, uh, writing functions as power series, right? So like we did, for example, we um, said that we can write 1 over 1 minus x. This is equal to the series n equals 0 to infinity of x to the n as long as absolute value of x is less than 1, right? And this came from the geometric series. You guys remember? OK. And then we also did um, inverse tangent of x, right? You guys remember this? We rewrote it as 1 over 1 plus x squared, and then we integrated. And so we ended up with the series n equals 0 to infinity of negative 1 to the n. And then what did we end up with? Do you guys remember? x to the, no, 2n plus 1 over 2n plus 1, right? OK. And this, again, was as long as absolute value of x is less than uh, 1, because basically we used this first one, right? OK. So, um, but so, and then we did another example, right, where we, um, where we did, uh, I guess, functions that look like the geometric series, but so we were able to rewrite them. But that was not really a good uh, way to come up with different functions, right? Because then you can have, you know, I don't know, like how, how can we write, let's say, for example, uh, sine of x as a power series. So can we do any kind of maneuvering so that it look, kind of looks like 1 over 1 minus x? Can you guys think of something? Not really, right? So the only reason why we were able to do it with inverse tangent is because, bless you, um, the derivative of inverse tangent is 1 over 1 plus x squared, and that looks like the geometric series. And so then we were able to go backwards using integration, right? So we, we are uh, yearning for a more concrete way to find power series representations of functions. Do we agree with that? Sure. Yes. OK, so you all really want a way to find power series representations of functions. So OK, so then you go, all right, so this is what, what we're going to do. We're going to, this is our strategy, as soon as this stops, OK. So this is our strategy. OK, so let's say you take a function, take a function. Uh, f of x, and we are going to pretend, pretend that um, it has a power series representation. So, um, okay, so I emphasize here that we are pretending like we can do this. So we don't really know whether every single function in existence has um, a power series representation, but we're going to pretend. So if a function has a power series representation, then it would have to look like this. It would have to look like, so this function would have to be written as um, a power series, so it would have to look like this, right? n equals 0 to infinity of a sub n times x minus c to the n, right? Because that's what all power series look like, right? You have a sequence, a sub n, and then you have x minus c raised to the n. So every power series that uh, we have looks exactly like this, right? So just in general. So, um, and this will help us um, make sense out of this. Let's start writing out some of these terms. So this is equal to, the first term would be a sub 0, right? Plus a sub 1 times x minus c plus a sub 2 times x minus c squared plus 
a sub 3 times x minus c cubed plus, and then, so this, so plus dot dot. So that's enough. OK. So again, so we take a function, and we pretend like it has a power series representation. Yes? So what we're trying to do is we're, we're, even though we don't quite fully understand why having power series representations of functions is important, uh, because we, we cannot see the full scope of the importance of this at this point in our lives. Um, so you have to, one, accept that they are important. So you just take it in good faith. Um, and then the, the only reason that I, that I have for you right now in this moment is that um, if you look at, a, at a, a power series, it is relatively simple, right? Because it's just x raised to power. So if you have a complicated function that you want to approximate, and if you can write it as a power series, then you always have a way of approximating a function up to a certain a degree of accuracy because you can always chop off the power series at a certain point. So like you can add up the first 10,000 and that would be a good approximation. Or the first five and that would be a good. So for right now, that's all I have. It's a good reason. But there are a lot more that you will learn later on in your lives. OK, but that's a good question because we want to know why, why would we want to do this, right? OK, so. Um, so Okay, so this is our this is our um, our dilemma here. So we have a function. Okay, so what we're saying here is that these two are exactly equal to each other, right? Okay, and they're both centered at well, sorry, and the power series is centered at c, right? So if they're both equal, then so let's put a little note here. So for f of x. Uh, to equal the power series, then um, all of its derivatives have to equal uh, each other at x equals to c. So this would, if they're both the same, then it has to have the same value at the center point of both, right? And it has to have the same first derivative at both, has to have the same second derivative at both, has to have the same third derivative at both. Otherwise, they're not equal, right? Do you guys agree with that statement? OK. So then what we do, what we're going to do is we're going to compare the uh, derivatives on the left side and the derivatives on the right side, OK? So take a look at, at this. Where did you take the derivatives? We haven't gotten the derivatives yet, but we're going to. So OK, so these are the uh, requirements. If I plug in c into uh, the function, so right now this is the function right here, right? OK, so you're going to have to use your, your uh, mental capacity at this point in time. OK, you guys ready? OK. So you have the right side right here, right? What happens if I plug in c into every single x here? Does the whole thing equal 0? No. Almost, right? All of them except a sub 0, right? So this one is 0, 0, 0. So all of them after a sub 0 are equal to 0. So that means that f of c would have to equal to a sub 0. Yes? OK. Now. Imagine you get the derivative, OK? All right, so we have this right here. And so you're imagining you get the derivative. And actually, all right, what I'll do is I'll write it down and then I'll erase it, because I don't want to clutter it with a whole bunch of stuff. But let's say I get the derivative, and I'm going to write it down up here in a little bubble. So what's the derivative of this right here? The derivative of a sub 0 is 0 plus, what is this one? a sub 1 plus 2 times a 2 times x minus c plus, and then I get, no, you know, so you keep going. But remember, you're plugging in c. So what's going to happen, for example, to this one? 
That's going to be 0, right? What's going to happen to all the ones over here? So what's the only thing left over if I plug in C? A sub 1, right? So that means that the derivative at C has to equal to A sub 1. Does that make sense? OK. So then what I'm going to do is now I'm going to get, actually, let me write down the, the derivative. So this would be a 3a sub 3x minus c to the second power. OK, so this is the first derivative, right? OK, so I'm going to dynamically change this to turn it into the second derivative. So the second derivative, so here I have the second derivative at c. So if I get this, the second derivative, or in other words, the derivative of this one, what do I, um, what happens? So obviously this is, the 0 goes away, right? What happens to the a1? Zero. Turns into 0, right? And then what happens to 2a2x minus c? What's the derivative of that? 2a2, two two. Two right? OK. And then what's the derivative of 3a3x minus c squared? What would that equal to? Six. Six, right? Three, you bring down the two, right? So this two comes down. The two comes down. And so what I'm going to end up with is three. So this is plus three times two times a sub three raised to the one, right? And then plus, so this is going to continue on forever, right? So what's the second derivative evaluated at c? So it's just 2a sub 2, right? Because this one's 0, and all the ones after that point are also 0. So here I get 2. So do you guys see the pattern that we're forming here? What would be the third derivative of at evaluated at c? The third derivative evaluated at c would equal to this one right here, right? 3 times 2 times a sub 3. So this is 3 times 2 times a sub 3. So if you continue this in this pattern, what is the nth? Or actually, let's use k here, not to be confused with. Or no, n is fine, because we've been using n. So what would the nth derivative evaluated at c equal to? n factorial times a sub n, right? And this exactly tells you, so from this, we get that what is a sub n equal to based off of this right here, this last one? If I solve for a sub n here, the nth derivative evaluated at c divided by n factorial. So what does, does that look familiar? Mm -hmm. What does it look like? The yeah, the Taylor polynomials, right? Aren't those the coefficients? These right here, these are the coefficients, coefficients for the Taylor polynomial, Taylor polynomial of f of x centered at x equals to c. Bam. So what does that mean? This is huge, massive. Do you guys know why it's massive? Because, check this out, what did we do? We pretended that a function has a power series representation. So we found that if it has a power series representation, that means that the coefficients would be exactly the same coefficients as the Taylor polynomial, which means that if a function has a power series representation, it has to be the Taylor polynomial. And that's huge, because what that gives us is that gives us a way to systematically find a power series for any, any, any function, as long as what? What's the only thing we need to know? We need to have to be able to write down a Taylor series. Has to be one thing. What's the only thing we need? 
What do we have to be able to find? What do we find when we find Taylor series? The yeah, the derivative, right? So all the derivatives have to exist. Okay. All right. So let's. Okay. So it's very exciting. So I need to calm down a little bit and and uh, write some things down. Okay. So all right. So let's write this down. So um, the so the Taylor series. The Taylor series of f of x centered at uh, x equals to c is given by um, the series n equals 0 to infinity of now we don't write a sub n in general. We have the specific coefficients. The specific coefficients are f, the nth derivative, evaluated at c over n factorial times x minus c to the n. Very exciting. Because now you can take any function, as long as you can uh, find the derivative of it, and then you can, um, as long as you can find the Taylor uh, polynomial, then you can write out the write it out as a uh, series. And so then you have a power series representation for any function, as long as you can find the right pattern. So what this means, though, is we can use all of the stuff that we've done before with Taylor polynomials. We can go back in and reuse all of that. So like, for example, um, so remember, so let's remember some of the, uh, some of the Taylor polynomials that we've done before. So you guys remember we did, um, um, so we had that um, for, so these we did a while ago. So you guys might not um, remember 100%, but remember we had e to the x and um, the, the uh, Taylor polynomial. Let's just do the, um, the McLaren polynomial which was, and let's make this one capital N so that. OK, so um, do you guys remember the Taylor polynomial of, uh, of e to the x? Remember it looked like 1 plus x plus x squared over 2 plus x to the third over 3 factorial plus all the way up to x to the n over n factorial. So this was the Taylor polynomial of e to the x. And so you can see the coefficients right here, right? Because what are all the derivatives of e to the x? e to the x. And evaluated at 0, all of those derivatives are equal to 1. So see, you see a 1 in front of all of these, and then over n factorial. So this is the Taylor polynomial. So the Taylor series. The Taylor series would be the Taylor series would be this, the infinite series from zero to infinity of x to the n over n factorial, right? So this one actually, let me let's write this one up as a sum. So this is the sum n equals 0 to n of x to the n over n factorial. So that was the Taylor polynomial. And then the Taylor series just takes that off to uh, infinity and beyond, like in Toy Story, right? <laughs> yes, I got it right this time. And uh, so the idea, what we're trying to, to get at is that this, the, power, the Taylor series for the, the function I want to be able to say that that is exactly equal to e to the x, given some uh, radius of convergence. So that depends on the function. OK, now, um, this, though, this is still a uh, question mark, because we're not 100% sure. Um, because So it's true for any n, right, that you can write down the Taylor polynomial. But do the question is, do the functions equal to each other if you take the sum to go off to infinity and beyond? 
So that's the question. This is what you want to know. Okay, so um, all right. So I know there's a lot to take in, but so let's go back real quick to reiterate the 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 massive contribution that we made right here. Okay? Okay, here we started with a function and we assumed that it had a power series rep representation. Yes? Okay. Assuming it has a power series representation, that means what we just did right here, we found that if it has a power series representation, then it has to equal to the Taylor series. Okay, that's huge. Because these are the coefficients, which are exactly the same coefficients as the Taylor series. Then the question is, does the Taylor series converge to the function? That's the next, uh, the next thing we want to know. So for that, we have a theorem. And the theorem is theorem. Okay. So um, let's take a, um, um, a function. Um, and let's say that we have the, um, the mm, let me see, k, no, let me use, um, okay, I'll use n just so that it's the same. Okay, so the uh, nth derivative, um, suppose that's bounded by some number k. Um, for all, for all n. Okay, so that means that the uh, the function is bounded, the first derivative is bounded, the second derivative is bounded, the third derivative is bounded, the fourth derivative, and so all of the derivatives are bounded above by k. Um, in in the uh, uh, interval of in the interval of uh, convergence. So this would be, so the interval of convergence, remember it's centered at C, so it would be C minus R and then C plus R, right? So we're assuming we have um, power series, we have the interval of convergence, and then the derivatives are all bounded. So, um, so then if this is true, uh, this means that um, the, the function f of x is equal to the Taylor series expansion. So in other words, the function, the Taylor series converges to uh, the function. Okay. All right, now, um, proof slash fun times. OK, so before we, we prove it, um, we need to remember, um, so you guys remember the, the nth uh, remainder for Taylor polynomials? Do you guys remember what that was? So capital R N of X was equal to, do you guys remember this? Back when we did Taylor polynomials. That's the difference between the function and the Taylor polynomial, right? So the remainder basically tells you how far off your Taylor <laughs> poly, bless you. How far off your Taylor polynomial is from your function, right? Okay, so um, okay, so um, what has to be true for um, for the function to equal to the um, the power series? What has to be true? So let's write it. Let's rewrite it as f of x is equal to t n of x plus rn of x. Okay, so take a look at um, 
so the the Taylor series is what we get when we uh, let capital N go to infinity, right? Okay. So what what should happen for the function to equal to the Taylor series? What has to be true about the remainder? Yeah, it has to go to zero, right? So for okay, so this is the key for f of x to equal to the um, the Taylor series, or let's put it, let's condense the notation a little bit. Let's say for uh, oh, for t n of x, what does the single arrow mean? Yeah, for the Taylor polynomial to converge to f of x, um, r n of x must must converge to must converge to zero. Okay, so this is what we're trying to show. We're trying to show that the remainder is going to converge uh, to zero, um, assuming that the derivatives are bounded. And so, what do we know about the remainder? Again, back from Taylor polynomials, we had an expression for it. Do you guys remember? You guys remember? Yeah, we have the error bound, right? So from from back in the day, back in the day, b i t d, the absolute value of capital R n of x is less than or equal to what? What was the error bound? K, K which represent what did K represent? Yeah, the bound on the n plus first derivative. And here we're assuming that all of the derivatives are bounded, right? So all of the derivatives are bounded above by k times, what else did we have on the error bound? Is that the same k? Yes, I used the same letter on purpose. Okay. Yeah, so the letter itself is irrelevant. The point is that it represents a bound on the derivatives. Um, and what else? What, what was inside of here? X minus, a. X minus, back in the notation back then it was a, but here it's x minus c, right? To the n plus 1. And here we're using capital N, so. Okay, over n plus 1 factorial, right? Okay, now, um, what is, what is um, x minus c? That's the, the distance, the maximum distance between um, the center point and all the values on your interval. So that would be, what is that called? We have a letter for that. Mm -mm. No. Yeah, it's R, right? It's the radius of convergence, right? So that's how big your interval is. So R to the n plus 1 over n plus 1 factorial. Okay, and then now what we have is k is just a number, right? So here we have r to the n plus 1, which is what kind of a function? It's a, so a number raised to a power, that is a exponential function, divided by the factorial, and so we already did this back in 10.1, which one dominates? The factorial, right? The factorial dominates the exponential function. Do you guys remember? We showed this using the, do you guys remember? My other class couldn't remember. Do you guys remember how we showed that, that this right here converges to 0? We use the, the squeeze theorem. Yeah, squeeze theorem. Great times. Another fun time, as usual. OK, so the point is that this is equal to 0. In other words, the remainder is going to um, converge to 0, which means that the, um, the function is equal to the, the Taylor series. Thumbs up? OK, so if the derivatives, all the derivatives are bounded, then that means that the, uh, no? No, you're good. Oh, OK. All right. Something else. Then. No. All right, so any questions on, on that? You guys ready for some examples? 
Yeah. Okay, so let's uh, let's do some examples of this. What kinds of things we can do? A lot of things with these. Let's see here. Okay, so um, so this means that um, so from uh, eight point four. So when back when in the day when we did uh, Taylor polynomials, we had that. Um, um, if we had, for example, sine of x, um, the, the Taylor polynomial of sine of x, do you guys remember what it is? Remember it was alternating, it was only the odds and, so, and it was alternating. So it started at 1 and then minus or no, not at 1, at x, right? Because it's the odds. Cosine starts at 1. So it was x and then minus x cubed over 3 factorial plus fifth over 5 factorial minus and so, um, and so on and so forth, right? So, um, so this, the Taylor polynomial ended up being um, x to the 2n plus 1 over 2n plus 1 factorial. And actually, times negative, times negative 1 to the n. Th this should match as well, 2n plus 1. OK, so oh, wait, let me fix that. OK, so negative 1 to the n. Um, capital N. So, okay, but then, so now what we have is we have the, um, the Taylor series. So if we extend that, we let capital N go into infinity. We have that sine of x is not only, so this is an approximation to sine x, right? But sine x is equal to the series x minus x cubed over 3 factorial plus x to the fifth over 5 factorial. But this time, we don't stop it at any point. We just keep going. So we put three dots, meaning that it's going to follow that pattern forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. And if we want to write this as a um, Taylor series, we would write it as the series n equals 0 to infinity of negative 1 to the n times x to the 2n plus 1 over 2n plus 1 factorial. Yes, yes? OK, and then this is true from the theorem that we just talked about. Uh, what do we know about all the derivatives of sine? They are always going to be bounded, right? Bounded by 1. So what's the radius of convergence of this series? Mm -mm. Mm -mm. What are the restrictions on the on the x values? On the x values? Mm -hmm. Does it converge? Does it di ever diverge? Does it always converge? What's the deal? Always no, this series right here. No, not sure. The convergence of this is actually for all real x values. So there are a couple ways to see this. You can, of course, do the ratio test, right, with the, with the um, power series, right? That's how we did it um, back in the day. So if you do the um, ratio test with this, you can see that the radius of convergence is infinite. Or you can use the theorem that we just talked about, that the derivatives are bounded. And so let's go back here. Um, so by this theorem, all the derivatives are bounded by what? Okay. The derivatives of sine. They're all bounded by 1, right? Because it's always sine, cosine, sine, cosine, sine, cosine, sine, cosine. And um, 
so um, then by this theorem, notice that, um, so take a look at right here. So it's bounded by one, right? And notice that um, if you, no matter what R is, what's always gonna happen with this, the remainder? It's always gonna converge to zero, right? Because R is just a number and then um, over n plus one factorial, so the factorial will always dominate no matter how big r is. So that's why the radius of convergence is, is infinite. Does that make sense? Yes, you guys with me? You guys seem semi with me. With me in spirit, at least, no? Okay, well, if you don't believe me still, you can do the ratio test with this one like what we did yesterday and the day before. Okay. Well, no, this is just from before. So this is what we know. Okay, so we're gonna use this. So let's do an example so of how we... Plus and minus infinity? R is infinity. Okay. So the interval of convergence is from negative infinity to positive infinity. So, um, so let's use this. So um, find, let's say we wanna find um, the Maclaurin series. What's the Maclaurin series? Yeah. Taylor series. series centered at zero, right? Um, for the function uh, x squared times sine of x. Okay, now, so we can always, what we've seen today is that we can. Um, find a power series representation for a function by hand by finding the Taylor polynomial, finding the pattern for the coefficients and, and writing it out, right? Okay, but this gives us a much more efficient way because we can use the series that we already have to create new series. So like if you look at this and you imagine getting the first derivative, second derivative, fourth <coughs> derivative, fifth derivative, does that sound like a fun time? does not sound like a very good fun time, right? Because you have to use the product rule and then you do the product rule once and then you have to do the product rule again and so you would get an ever increasing expanding uh, e expression there, right? Okay, so not a fun time, but notice that we already know that sine of x, so this is what we have, we know that sine of x is equal to this series right here, right? So I'm just gonna rewrite it again. Seri sine of x is equal to the series n equals 0 to infinity of negative 1 to the n x to the 2n plus 1 over 2n plus 1 factorial. So if I want the Taylor series for x squared times sine of x, what do I do? If I already know this. Exactly, you just multiply both sides by x squared. Well, yeah, because what changes on, on this side? Well, no, it does change, right? It's a different series, but what happens to it? So I'm multiplying a sum by x squared. What happens to that x squared? It gets distributed through, right? Do you guys agree? So that x squared... Well, yeah, but you want to bring it inside because you don't want to just kind of hang it out on the outside. That's like, that's like inviting somebody to the party and then telling them they can't come inside where the fun is. And that is messed up. Because why would you invite them to the party in the first place? It's better to just not at all. Yeah, I mean, that's just mean, right? Is what? Or some parties. <laughs> what? <laughs> okay, anyways, what happens when I bring the x squared inside? <laughs> what do I end up with? x to the... 2n plus... Close. 2n plus 3, right? Over 2n plus 1 factorial. So does that make sense how we can easily, so we have a list of known ones. So like we have, for example, e to the x, we know 
sine of x we know, cosine x we know, because we found all of them before, right? We know 1 over 1 minus x, and so all of the ones that look like that. Yeah, go ahead. How is that x2 plus 3 not? Well, because every single uh, term is multiplied by x squared, right? So then we add the exponents. But we don't multiply the exponents, we add the exponents. Because we're multiplying. So, um, is that all the ones we need to know, those four? Mm, well, you have, um, well, yeah, you need to know, yeah, sine, cosine, e to the x, 1 over 1 minus x. Those are the big ones. Yeah. And then you can use those to find other ones. Um... Okay, let's do another one, because that was fun times. Let's see, how about, um, how about, um, let's say you want to write McLaurin series. Okay, why don't you guys give me one for fun? Five. Five. Oh, my God. Forget it. Forget it. What is it? Oh, wait, sine, okay, let's do um, sine of, well, no, that one's, we just did one with sine. Okay, let's do, how about um, e to the x over x squared, x cubed. Okay, so what should we do? What's our strategy? Write the series for e to the x. Ooh, wait, no, even better. Oh. Okay, not e to the x, but e to the two x squared. Ooh, snap. Okay, so all right. So where what should be our starting? What should yeah? What should be our starting point? E to the x. E to the x. Okay, so we know that e to the x. So we know e to the x is equal to the series n equals 0 to infinity of x to the n over n factorial. OK. So then what should be our next step? Next step up? Find e to the, not e to the x, but e to the 2x squared, right? So instead of using this, what's the only difference? What am I going to do? What am I going to change to rewrite that first initial part? Two x squared. Two x squared what? So this is what I have, right? For e to the x, I have x to the n, so then for e to the 2x squared, I would have 2x squared raised to the n over n factorial, right? So if I simplify this a little bit, I would get the series n equals 0 to infinity of, what would that look like? 2 to the n x to the 2n over n factorial. OK, and then after that, now I want to divide by x cubed, right? So I'm going to then divide. So I have e to the 2x squared is equal to this series, right? 2 to the n, x to the 2n over n factorial. So I take that and I divide by x cubed. So I can divide it here by x cubed. And so what does that give me? Well, you don't, you want to clean it up because, you know, it just looks ugly to have, then you have multiple colors in there, you know, what's what, what is it? 
Why? What? Um, oh, because we're dividing both sides by x to the third. Because uh, the problem was to find a, a Taylor series for that. 2n minus, yeah, 2n minus 3, right, over n factorial. And this one also um, is for all real numbers. 